We are so glad that you're here today. This is, we have an excellent show for you again, as usual. And um, I bet we're getting lots of folks that are going to want to hear about what Tucker Taylor has to say about how he makes that fabulous garden grow so beautifully at Kendall Jackson uh, Estate and Winery. And we also have um, Ellie Samuel and myself, we are going to go through and talk about what you do with your garden right now, what's happening right now. And then we have Suzanne Young, who is a master food preserver, and she's going to be showing us and teaching us how to preserve pumpkin because um, a lot that is one um, vegetable that a lot of people go through and um, mishandle this time of year. So we're going to make sure we show you just how to use it. So, okay, so for this one, your audio and video will be off for this webinar. If you want us to look at your questions, I will put them in the Q&A rather than the chat. Um, this Zoom talk is being recorded. And it will be available, um, you know, later on on our website. Usually, we get it up within the week. And I just wanted to to let you know that um, with everything you pick up on the internet, make sure you notice the date because our world is changing. You know, the climate's changing. Everything's changing, uh, and guidelines are being updated. So we follow the science and we want to make sure that we give you the most timely information possible so that um, we keep you safe and you're doing the best thing that you can for your garden. You can go, we have lots of great resources. You can, um, if you have your phone ready, and we have that QR code that's coming up here in a second. Um, you can, this is Sonoma County Master Gardener website is a great resource for lots of food gardening um, information. You can find, you know, hover over food gardening tab and view a drop down menu and you want food gardening with less water. If you haven't already clued into using less water, I'm sure you have if you're listening. Um, some really good ideas are in there. So here's what our web page looked like. And here's that you can see where the pink arrow is, food gardening with less water. And there's lots of great food gardening articles right above that too. There's our QR code. So if you capture that, then it'll take you directly to that spot or you can just play around on our website. Okay, so we are master gardeners and we practice sustainable gardening. Um, we nurture and protect our soil. And this time of year, I'm gonna give you a few tips on what to do for that. Uh, we mulch to save water and prevent weeds. That's also something that is changing, you know, in our area because of fire safety. We don't use synthetic fertilizers, herbicides, or pesticides. We try to grow the soil and that whole mycorrhizal network, and we want it to work for us. Um, we cause minimum soil disturbance because it wrecks the mycorrhizal network. We use flowers that benefit plants and beneficial insects. And we use compost and organic amendments. Um, this is a great time of year to apply some compost. We also, to save ourselves and our garden a lot of headache, we plant the right place in the, the right plant in the right place at the right time. And right now with all of our water uh, issues, planting the right plant might need to wait. So it's fall. So my name is Toby Brown and I'm a Sonoma County Master Gardener. And this is my gardener garden. And this is what's happening in my garden. The picture that you see on the left is one a bed that I had some pumpkins in edible pumpkins. I, I figure if I'm using the water for pumpkins that they need to be edible so that, you know, it's, it's water well spent. So after the pumpkins are matured and I turned off the water and let them, you know, fully um, uh, uh, cure, then I went through and this is what I had left on the right. So it looks pretty bad, but you notice I do have some straw mulch on there. Um, and, but I, I am going to put something else in that bed this fall. Um, so here's one thing you can do. This is another bed that I have. You can plant a fall garden. So mine is done pretty much anything that I was going to put in has been put in. 
So here's my hints for you after making probably every mistake I could make um, over the years here. Um, you want to, I plant from starts most things. I do things like beets from seeds. So you want to plant things. And notice I didn't put any mulch down to start with. Um, insects in August were sort of, are a big, big deal. So I put a, a, a insect barrier over the top. And that sort of protected those little guys while they were growing up and getting a little bit bigger. But because they're cool weather crops, they don't really want a lot of sun that, that in my house, it's very sunny. So I covered them with um, a shade cloth and that really tends to help. And now they're much bigger and doing well. So let's say, okay, hooray, you know, you planted your fall garden, but maybe you're just so done. You've had, you know, there's water issues. You can't do it anymore. You just want to take a break. That's fine. We're no, no judging. We want to go through and remove the mulch. This is that same sad pumpkin bed. And so I took all the mulch off and I'm cutting the old plants um, down just below the soil line. I leave the roots in as we try to encourage everybody to do. And what happens is they compost in place. They will go ahead and break down. And then as all the plants that you're taking out, you wanna take a look at them. Sanitation is critical. It's a huge issue. So you wanna get rid of plants and leaves that have issues. So like this, yes, there's aphids all over this. I don't want to just throw that in my compost pile. If it's something edible for my chickens, I can give it to them and they love it. But otherwise you wanna go ahead and put them in your green bin. Sonoma County, um, they go through and do a hot compost. Well, it's transferred out and it does a hot compost. So the insects shouldn't be an issue. If it's something terrible, bad that you know this is really diseased then you know you can go ahead and put it in your uh, regular garbage can but they're trying to reduce a lot of that green waste and make it all go into the green bin so you need to deal with your insect issues so you need to go through and figure out mm, where are those aphids going that maybe were there and come up with a solution then you need to check your irrigation. Please don't be one of those people that lets their irrigation go on and on when we're in such a terrible drought. So this bed I went through and I laid out the, the lines that I have and I turned on the irrigation. So you can see over here on the right where I have the little mean and lows pliers there. I went through and poked uh, and pointing at one of the inline emitters that's not working. So that needs to be fixed. Um, if I'm going to plant something else or, you know, just to let myself know. Um, there's not a whole lot you can do with just one little guy. You can, um, you, if the whole line isn't working, if you pull the plug out at the end, it'll flush it out. Also, I would go through and clean your, um, your filters uh, if you have on the beds that are going on. I want you to notice too that the middle picture, I've got an on off valve there, all right here. So I can- Toby, you are at five minutes. Okay, thank you. You can turn that off on the beds that you're not gonna use. Okay, then you're gonna add amendments like worm castings and compost. And then you're gonna add mulch to cover the soil. Yes, we can still use straw. Notice there's spaces between my raised beds. You certainly don't wanna put any of this down within five feet um, of your house because that's the you know no grow zone for fire safety. You can still use dry leaves and compost as a mulch works very well as well. Okay, now I'm gonna hand it off to Ellie and Ellie's gonna to talk to you about planting fava beans to eat because the third thing you can do is plant a cover crop. Okay, welcome. Um, I'm talking about fava beans. And again, I'm going to reiterate, if you have terrible re water restrictions because you live in certain parts of the county, I would suggest very strongly that you put your garden to bed and wait until spring and hope that the rains do come. Now, why fava beans? Favas are drought tolerant 
until they flower. They only need an inch of water a week. They also keep the soil covered and because they're nitrogen fixers, they feed the soil. If you pull out one of the plants that is mature, if you look at the roots, they'll have little nodules on them. And those nodules are what feeds the soil. They, they fix the nitrogen by taking the, it from the air, which the plants can't access and changing it into something the plants can access. Um, they attract pollinators. They're one of the first crops to flower. And when the beneficial insects and pollinators hatch, they have a food source with the fava bean flowers and they combat erosion. Next slide, please. If you're going to plant them to get faster germination, you need to soak them for 12 to 24 hours in filtered water. Then you can plant them in your garden. The seeds are planted now because with our climate, you can overwinter them and they will begin growing in the spring. Next, please. Okay, before you plant, decide the quantity of fava beans you're going to use. Favas can are, grow very tall, but they do come in dwarf varieties. Read the seed packet carefully. If you're only planting for beans, consider chopping and dropping, which is called green manure, to fix the nitrogen and help amend your soil. Next, please. You direct sow your seed one to two inches in the soil and six inches apart. Again, this is a choice you're going to make. You can say to yourself, okay, my family needs this many beans. I can freeze this many beans and the rest of them I am going to use as green manure. And that way you're not using as much water because the plants that are chopped and dropped are out of the picture. Okay. Fava bean flowers, they're beautiful. They bloom, the, they bloom early, just like what, and they help the beneficials like I talked about before. Now, when and if you decide you're just using it as green manure, you chop them, drop them, and cover them with compost. And you let them sit the, the green under the compost to decompose and feed the soil. And by spring, you will have very healthy soil. Next, the fava beans themselves, they take between 80 to 100 days before they are ready to harvest and eat. As you can see, each plant gives you a lot of fava beans. So judge carefully what you're planting and what you're going to use. And there are some fava beans, okay. Fava beans do need to be cooked and shelled before you eat them. Once they are cooked, you can slip the skin that's on the seeds easily off and then the beans are ready to use. Next, please. I would love you to enjoy your fava beans, whether you're feeding your soil, feeding yourself or doing both. Thank you. Thank you, Ellie, that was great. And so you can do one or the other. You can go through and chop and drop, um, which is fabulous for your soil, or you can go ahead and eat them or you can go through and chop and drop some of them. I've done both because we all love fava beans. They are delicious. Yeah, and I have done both too. Yeah. So now we're going to go through and we have Suzanne Young is a master food preserver 
and we she is going to master food preservers are like master gardeners but what we deal with is going through and teaching people how to use the the produce they grow in their garden or make the most of the produce that they get from their farmers markets or from the store and handling food in a safe way um, so uh, master food preserver program is to keep Californians safe and use culturally appropriate research-based practices to safely preserve food in the home and definitely reducing food waste. Don't throw anything away. So we have, we're going to talk about pumpkins today. And you know, I, I mentioned that I use pumpkins, I grew pumpkins in my garden and I don't feel guilty about using the water. I didn't have to water them very often, and um, but boy, they're so delicious. So here are three of the different types of pumpkins that you can use if you're going to eat them. Uh, good afternoon. Today we're going to talk about pumpkins. Um, I've washed my hands. I sanitized my surface. So I'm not going to wear gloves because I don't cook well in gloves, but um, everything's clean, including all my pumpkin and all that. Uh, today, I want to talk a little bit about puree, pumpkin puree. Um, pumpkin puree is what you get when you bake a pumpkin and you scoop it out and then you have a pumpkin puree. It cannot be safely canned. You have to be very careful of it. There's a couple of reasons. One of, one of them is pumpkin is a very low acid food. So therefore it cannot be water bath canned safely. The other thing is it's very dense. And when you're water bath canning, you want the temperature to be consistent throughout the whole product. And if it's not, then it really isn't safe to eat. So we suggest and really insist upon using a pumpkin and freezing it. Um, pumpkin butter is very easily frozen um, or you can put it in the fridge for like a week but it kind of loses its viscosity and its flavor if you do it more than a week. So I suggest if you make it, you freeze it. And we'll talk a little bit about how you freeze it later. Um, okay, so here we go. We've got the pumpkin here. This is a sugar pie pumpkin. And as Toby said, there are several different pumpkins you can use for um, making pumpkin puree, but don't use a carving pumpkin because it's very fibrous and it's hard to puree and make it a smooth product, which is what you need in order to make the pumpkin puree to either make into butter or to use for a pumpkin pie. So we've got this little pumpkin here and the easiest way to cut a pumpkin is to cut it this way and then turn it and cut it this way. And you'll meet at the bottom and you've got to use a really sharp, uh, like a chef's knife. This is an awesome, oh, I didn't quite make it even, but this is a good chef's knife to use. And I just sharpened it before I used it. Be really careful because you can slip, you know, the knife can slip and you can cut yourself. So, okay, so here we go. We're gonna open this guy up. Okay, and there he is, all right. And the next thing you're gonna do is scoop out the seeds. Now, when you scoop out the seeds, I like a melon baller because you can get close to the skin, close to the insides, because one of the important things is make sure you get all that, all that uh, white uh, film, film inside the pumpkin because that can tend to make your butter bitter if you don't get all that. So after you do that, all right, then I'll show you a done pumpkin, but also you can use the pumpkin seeds um, when you take them out, you separate them from the insides and then dry them, you know, dry them on a cookie sheet for like overnight. And then you can put them in oil, just put a little bit of olive oil on them and then season them any way you want. I happen to make some and I put barbecue seasoning on it and it's, they're really tasty. Um, and you can put them in little jars, you can give them away. Um, but when you do this, you bake them in an oven, you put the olive oil on and then put all the seasonings on and then you bake them in the oven and they're you know great and then you've used the pumpkin okay so now let's talk about here is a pumpkin that i pulled out that i did already bake okay 
goes in a 400 degree oven and depending on how large the pumpkin is, is how long you cook it for. But here we've got the pumpkin and this is kind of fun because the sugar pie pumpkin, this, the, if you can see this, the skin will come right off. It's really simple to get off. It just peels right off. So after you have your pumpkin like this, then you put it in a bowl or you can, there's three ways you can puree it. You can puree it with a food processor, which is ideal if you have one. You can puree it with um, an immersion blender, okay? You can just put it in a bowl and use an immersion blender. Don't put anything with it when you're pureeing, just leave it all plain. Or you can use a, um, let's see, what did I say? You could use a food processor, an immersion blender, or a food mill. That's the other thing you could do to get it. So that's what you do to get the puree. You put it in a bowl and you smoosh it down and get the puree. Now I have to wash my hands real quick. Wow. So Suzanne, I have a question for you already. How long did you cook your pumpkin? Um, it depends on how big it is, Toby, but usually a pumpkin um, this size, a pumpkin the size that I had, it probably is about 30 to 45 minutes. You want to cook it so your knife goes in very easily, okay? You want to cook it so it's soft but not smushy. So there's that kind of fine line, but um, yeah, usually 35 to 40 minutes. Okay, after you've cooked your pumpkin, you end up with a pumpkin puree. And I cook I, after I pureed it. And this is our pumpkin puree that was the development of smooshing the pumpkin. Um, this can be frozen just like this. It can be used for pumpkin pie, for pumpkin casseroles as a side dish. Um, you don't have to put anything with it. It's super sweet and it's delicious. Um, but again, you got to use the right kind of pumpkin. Um, just as a little side tip, the canned pumpkin you buy is not actually pumpkin. It's actually winter squash, a variety of winter squash that they have developed to make what they call canned pumpkin. The reason they can call it pumpkin is because pumpkin and squash are in the same family. So if you want pure pumpkin for your holiday, you have to make your own. Okay, so once you get your puree, this is an ideal pot to use to cook your puree down to make your butter because this pot is nonstick. And because this is so thick, it will stick. So you've got to be really careful when you cook it. You've got to cook it slowly and watch it and use a spatula, you know, a heat proof spatula to just make sure you get it on the bottom so that you don't burn the bottom. Uh, once you put it in, then you can season it uh, the way you want. And I have a couple things. We gave you a recipe, but the recipe is one of those recipes that you can guide yourself. Um, you can, do it to your own taste. Um, the thing about doing this is make sure you use the best possible ingredients you can buy. Because again, the flavor is indicative of what kind of product you use. This is an organic um, apple juice, no sugar added. It's not filtered, it's unfiltered. This is what I would suggest you use for your apple juice. Be sure and use pure maple syrup. Um, you know, if you buy the syrup that they purportedly call syrup, unless it says maple syrup and you read on the back that it's only maple syrup, you're going to get fructose corn syrup and things that aren't going to taste very good. And then as far as spices go, I like this pumpkin pie spice and you can buy this. There's several manufacturers and you can buy it in the grocery store um, because it has all the ingredients in it that you would normally put in it. Um, I have a tip also that I think is really important. Every November, when I go through my spice cabinet, I always buy fresh spices for my holiday baking. It makes a tremendous amount of difference and it's really important because it, spices lose their flavor and they lose their punch. And so when it calls for a half a teaspoon, if it's not fresh, you may have to put a little bit more 
which unfortunately will change the color of your product. So you don't want to put a lot of this or you're going to get kind of a yucky color that doesn't look very appetizing. So fresh spices, very important. When you cook this, you cook it for probably about 20 minutes. Um, but again, it's to your own liking. Don't, don't worry about, you know, oh, gee, it says to cook it for 30 minutes. I don't want it this thick. Well, don't worry about that. Cook it the way you want it. I mean, how, what kind of consistency do you actually want it to be? Once you've got it cooked, then you can either freeze it or you can refrigerate it. Now, the other thing that I think is important to talk about is freezing. Freezing should be done only in freezer approved packaging. This is freezer approved because it's hard plastic. It, it seals totally tight, right, which you want. You don't want any air. And when you freeze it, leave some space because it will expand as it freezes. So, you know, leave it, leave like maybe uh, three quarters of an inch at the top. You can freeze in this, you can freeze in mason jars. The other thing you can do, you can freeze in, oh, wait a minute, one other thing I wanna say, don't freeze in Ziploc. Okay, Ziploc is flimsy, it's not airtight, so don't freeze in it because chances are it'll get freezer burn really quickly. Don't freeze anything in these kind of containers. These are good for storing in the fridge, but not for freezing. Okay, so if you wanna freeze in a bag, there's a couple of ways you can do it. You can put your product in, and then you can seal it up into the corner, leave a little bit of airspace, maybe like a finger type, take a straw, Put it in, but don't put it in the product. Make sure you don't do that or you end up drinking pumpkin butter. And then suck through the straw and you'll get the air out. The other trick you can do if you don't like that trick is you can take a bowl of water and make sure after you use this water that you put it someplace with a purpose, like on a plant. Don't throw it away. Okay. So then you take your product and put it in your freezer bag. Again, make sure it's a freezer bag, not just a plastic bag, okay? And then seal it up, leave a little space right in the corner, just like you did before, and dunk it in the water. And the interesting thing is, this sucks all the air out. When you do this, and look, you don't have any air in your product. So that's another trick. So you can do it either way. Um, it keeps in the freezer for probably about six months, um, but chances are you won't have it six months. Um, the recipe, we also provided you a recipe for some pumpkin, spice pumpkin bread that you can use your pumpkin butter for, and it's delicious. It's a, really a nice pumpkin bread. You can make it in a big loaf or little loaves. Uh, you can also give it away. The only thing about giving it away is make sure you label it that it needs to be refrigerated. Um, people sometimes don't think when you hand them something, they say, oh yeah, I'll just put this on the shelf and use it at Thanksgiving. No, you got to put on it, must be refrigerated or frozen, you know, whichever product. So um, I think that's it. Thank you very much for watching. Awesome. Thank you, Suzanne. That was very interesting. And of course, I've already made it. And I did find a recipe online where you could actually do a pumpkin spice latte um, with this. So I'm just saying, it's, it's a very, very yummy. Um, we are going to take a little visit to Kendall Jackson Estate and Winery. And I tell you, I'm going to bring him back to the beginning. And before I, I show you this, I'm always amazed at the people who <laughs> go to Kendall Jackson to drink wine. I mean, I'm sure that that's a great thing to do, but boy, the first place I always go is to the garden. They have such a beautiful garden. Good afternoon, I'm Dana Aguero, Master Gardener here in Sonoma County. And today we have the privilege to be at the Kendall Jackson Wine Estate and Gardens. And we are so fortunate to be able to speak with Tucker Taylor, Taylor, Master Gardener, and also the Director of Culinary Gardens here at uh, Kendall Jackson. Welcome, Tucker. Appreciate Thanks, you Dana. being here. Um, so, Tucker, tell us a little bit about 
what you do here at Kendall Jackson um, and how you got here. So I manage a team of gardeners here and uh, we grow produce for our in-house culinary team as well as chefs in the Bay Area. Um, so we uh, really focus on specialty crops and uh, crop rotation. I started gardening. My father had a summer garden every year and just really loved being outside. Uh, and I ended up going to Florida and studying business administration, but I really had no idea what I wanted to do when I graduated. Uh, I got a job at a bank and I <laughs> didn't like that. Um, <laughs> and I was always coming home to unwind in my garden. So one day it dawned on me, this is what I want to do. So I went back to UF and earned a second degree in environmental horticulture. And since then I've de designed and managed organic farms uh, outside of Portland, Oregon and outside of Atlanta, Georgia before moving to California in 07 to redesign the culinary garden at the French Laundry. Um, and so I was with Chef Keller for just over five years and uh, I began consulting on the side and a friend of mine brought me here to this estate and I just fell in love with the space and I've had the, um, the fortune to be farming here for just over eight years now. Well, and just seeing the garden and, you know, coming in and out of over 10 years of this garden and what you've done since you've been here, I mean, it's amazing and beautiful and we can't wait to show everybody what you got. And let's talk a little bit about soil. Um, what are the best practices that you do here? What uh, type of compost do you use? Let's, um, can you talk a little bit about what you're doing and yes. maybe suggest some things for the at-home gardener as well? So we consider ourselves soil farmers here uh, since that's the foundation of everything we do. So mainly we add a lot of compost, we rotate our crops, and we plant cover crops in the wintertime. And as a result, uh, we have 10% organic matter in our soil, which is very high. Um, and that results in our ability to harvest nutrient-dense produce that is super vibrant, super flavorful, and has longer shelf life as a result. So as you can see right here, our soil has really good tilt. So you can squeeze it together and it holds its shape, but then it easily crumbles apart. And so what that does is allow for the roots of the plants to move through the soil a lot easier. Um, and then, um, like I said before, having 10% organic matter means that this soil is packed full of nutrients and packed full of microbes, which are thus helping feed the plants. You mentioned tilth. Can you talk a little bit more about tilth? Yeah, tilth refers to the physical characteristics of the soil. And, um, you know, there are soils that are heavy clay, which are challenging to grow in. There are soils that are really sandy, which also have their challenges. Uh, we're fortunate here in Sonoma County to have really good soils, especially here in the Russian River Valley. Um, and like I mentioned before, uh, the soil, because of the organic content, has really nice tilth. Uh, so it's just easier for the roots to make their way through and get the nutrients that they need. And then we, um, can you touch a little bit more on like, you know, your practices of um, fertilizers, like com your uh, synthetic, uh, conventional um, fertilizers. Absolutely. So although we're not certified organic here in this farm, we uh, grow with organic practices. Um, so we choose not to use synthetic fertilizers. Uh, I feel like if you think about steroids, they're really good in the short run to help an injury, overcome an injury, but over the long term, they can be detrimental to your health and I feel like it's the same with uh, applying synthetic fertilizers to your soil because you're uh, in the long run diminishing your microbial populations. And so by adding compost, we're inoculating our soils, not unlike we eat sauerkraut and kimchi and yogurt to inoculate our guts. Uh, and it's those microorganisms that ultimately help feed your plants. Can you t talk a little bit about tilling? You know, there's 
you know, to till or not to till, um, kind of what you do in your practices here and, and maybe what's, you know, yeah, it's a big, you have a big operation here and you produce food for many restaurants and it's a business, but what you do here and then maybe, you know, what would your recommendation would be for the at-home person? So uh, we are approaching no-till here. Um, we're not completely no-till. Um, we call ourselves low-till and we have a what's called a harrow plow so that fits on the back of our walk behind tractor so instead of inverting the soil like a traditional tiller this is more like an egg beater so we're only just incorporating our compost into the top three or four inches of the soil uh, and then once or twice a year in our beds we go through and we break up the hard pan and you can see how fluffy the soil is. Mm -hmm. Beautiful. So, walking through your garden, when I first get here, I see hardly, there's no weeds. And you know, for me, it's a constant problem in my house, at my house, in my garden. So, can you tell us a little, about, little bit about what you, your practices are for weeding and how you get this to look so amazing? So, we do have our fair share of weeds, uh, but we do our best to stay on top of them and cultivate when the weeds are very small because it's a lot easier to remove the weeds when they're very small and their roots aren't very established than it is once they become more established. I guess uh, I'm a lost cause then. Mine are pretty big. <laughs> so these are a couple of our favorite hand weeders. Uh, this is my favorite. This is a wire weeder. This is designed by one of my mentors, Elliot Coleman, and this is for really fine weeds and for finesse weeding in crops like these newly germinated carrots. And then these two are stirrup hoes, and you can see they kind of move back and forth. Um, these are for a little bit larger weeds um, or crops that are a little bit sturdier. So I'll show you real quick. So this is the wire weeder. And you can see, you just go back and forth. And it really cuts the roots and does a nice job of cultivating. And then the wire weeder, which is my favorite, you can see you can really get in there and fine tune your weeding in between your crops. So even though there's there are weeds in between the carrots, you can get in between the carrots and pull the weeds out. As the first week of fall and all of us at home gardeners are kind of starting and, and uh, starting to turn our, our beds over to our fall garden, I'm looking at your amazing lettuce. And can you talk a little bit about the two different types we're looking at here? Sure, so here we have the base of our salad mix. So this is a basic lettuce mix, uh, several different varieties. We direct seed this and we get several cuttings off of this bed. And over here we have head lettuces. So there's a couple different varieties there. Um, these are primarily going into our farm box as well as for our in-house culinary team. Can, why is this one covered and that one's not? So this one we're getting ready to harvest today so we took the cover off. Uh, this is bird netting. So this keeps out birds, rabbits, uh, deer, any type of animal that you're concerned about. And is it typical to plant it that tight? Is that is that is there a benefit to that with pests, or is it just? So we plant things really closely uh, so that we can get the soil covered, um, and that way we can keep the good stuff in the soil without it. Evaporate. Tucker, you mentioned on this lettuce here that you get three cuttings. Can you explain what that means? And then over here, like, how do you harvest this lettuce? What's the difference? Okay, so we pretty much either take a knife or some scissors and we go through and we cut about two inches above the base of the lettuce. And after a week, that lettuce will then push up new growth and then we'll harvest it again. For our production, we found that any more than that, the lettuce gets a little tough, but 
for home gardeners, you might get even more cuttings off of your lettuce. And for our head lettuce over here, um, we harvest right at the base, and then once we're finished with the row, we'll go through with a rake and pull the stumps out, so to speak. But at home, you might want to cut just below the soil surface, and that way you could just leave your roots to compost in place. Tucker, I really appreciate you taking the time out of your busy day to uh, talk to all of us today, and um, I wish you a great fall harvest, and I hope we can do it again sometime. Yeah, thank you, Dana. Thanks for visiting. Hope you come back soon. Now, hopefully you could hear that all and um, that everything matched up. It's tricky with the video going through and, and um, sharing that. Um, but we so appreciate Tucker for, and Dana for, for being on and showing us that gorgeous garden. Okay, so now we're going to do a few questions. And so let me, Dana, what's the first question that we can... So the, Toby, the first question um, is just talking about compost. Um, we had a couple questions of um, someone asking, it's anonymous attendee, it says um, that, how long does it take to compost the roots in the soil? Um, this person said their tomato roots grew and grew and never composted, so. Okay, so let's see. Do we have Tucker on right now? I don't see him, so. Um, I can answer that question. Uh, you know, it might have been because you didn't cut it below, if you cut it below the soil line, if it has any sun at all, it wants to keep growing unless, you know, you've, you've reached a frost or something. So um, cut it underneath the soil line and they should be okay. The beds that you're going to, um, that you're gonna put to bed, those should be just fine and they shouldn't grow back up. And if you put a layer of um, uh, uh, mulch over the top, that also helps to keep that light out. Um, sometimes if you've had a tomato plant that is uh, diseased, um, you always will pull all the roots out anyway. So, um, you know, that's always a good thing to do. Okay, we have a question from Mary. And it says, how long does it take for fava beans to decompose under compost? So Ellie, that's for you. Okay. I have found that it takes four to six weeks for the leaves to truly decompose under the compost. So the sooner you chop and drop them, the faster you will get that beautiful nitrogen rich soil that helps all your other plants grow too. And Ellie, what did you say about when to chop and drop? How, how do they know when to chop and drop? Just as the plant is beginning to flower, you chop and drop it. Okay, and it's so hard to do that because they're so pretty and, you and just they're so beautiful, them. yeah. But you need, to, you need to give it the time like Ellie said so that you will have time to go through and let it decompose before you plant. Okay. Also, Toby, um, Tucker is on the line. He is on, so he is awesome. in our, he's just under TC. So um, okay. Tucker can unmute himself to answer any questions. Okay, perfect. So Tucker, do you want to, <laughs> you want to amend every, anything I've said about um, the, the roots under the soil? Okay, well, Dana, have him just break in when he um, when the, he gets on or when he gets unmuted. Okay, I'm, my next question is, why should you remove the straw mulch when changing a bed? Why not add compost on top and let it compost in place? <clears throat> That's a good question. You, you certainly could go through and do that. It sort of depends on what was there and if the, uh, if it's in a raised bed or if it's in the ground, I would guess that if it's in the ground, if it's in the ground and you've cut them off, you know, just under the soil line, you could leave the straw mulch there. <coughs> I also, uh, you want to make sure though that you're, you know, checking the irrigation that you don't have some leak that's going on. Um, but but some people do go ahead and and do theirs, let their straw mulch 
decompose right there. If you Toby, have, mm -hmm. I'm yes. sorry, uh, the worms love straw mulch. And they, I think if you have found that your plants are healthy in the beds that have been straw mulched, that it's fine to leave them. Um, and if you feel that you can push it, you can sort of push it aside to check the irrigation heads too. But if you have a diseased plants, you want to take that straw out also. The insects overwinter under it. Excellent. That is exactly right. Or if you've had, like she said, diseased tomatoes or something there, you want to get every little thing out of there that you possibly can. Um, let's see. Karen's asking if you chop and drop, do you ever mix it into the soil or just leave on top of your soil? Ellie, do you want to answer that? I just leave it on top of the soil because I don't like to disturb the soil. As you dig in, you're dis uh, disturbing the mycorrhizal root, I mean, network that's underneath. And so you want to keep the soil as undisturbed as possible. Excellent. That, yeah, that's great. The, the less you disturb the soil, the better. That's for sure. Um, let's see. Okay, so Suzanne, are you ready? I'm ready. Okay. Your question is, what do you think about a roasting a whole pumpkin, skin, seeds, and all, without cutting it first? Re remove the stuff afterwards. Um, I think you could do it. I would be very careful. I would poke holes in it so the steam could escape. Um, so, you know, it wouldn't explode in your oven, God forbid. But uh, yeah, I think if you poked holes in it, um, it just, it probably would take longer to cook, but I think it would probably be fine as long as the steam could ex escape from the pumpkin. Excellent. Thank you. Great question. Okay, let's see. Here's another question about uh, taking the, it says, how long does it take to compost the roots in the soil? My tomato roots grew and grew. Oh, never mind. We already answered that one. Um, okay, Suzanne, back to you. Yep. Where do you find the edible pumpkins and how do you distinguish them from carving pumpkins? Uh, well, I bought my sugar pie pumpkins at a farm stand in Sonoma uh, that somebody had grown them. So um, you can find them. I've seen them in the grocery stores. I've seen them at Oliver's. I've seen them at Whole Foods. I haven't seen them in the big chain grocery stores. Um, but if you go online, uh, Toby sent me a good link and maybe we can put that link out. Um, of edible pumpkins, because there's a lot more than sugar pie and uh, Cinderella, all those, those are the most popular. But as I said, don't use a carving pumpkin because it just is way too fibrous and stringy. And you'll usually know by the price. If you yes, go to the grocery exactly. store, like at Safeway, they have them and they'll, they'll be, you take it up and you go, oh my gosh, that couldn't be right. <laughs> yeah, right. So <laughs> yeah. they're definitely, they're usually more expensive. Okay, let's see. Um, this is for you also, Suzanne. Why not remove the seeds and the membranes after baking the pumpkin instead of before? Because it makes a huge mess. <laughs> uh, yeah, no, remove them before. Uh, if you let them cook into the pumpkin, it's really hard to remove them. So definitely remove them before. And there's a question on where's the pumpkin butter recipe that she mentioned. It's, uh, it's in the notes that if you go to our link, um, it should be right there. Um, but basically all you do, there are very few ingredients. So go through those ingredients one more time. Really, you don't actually need a printed recipe for the pumpkin butter, because really what you wanna do is you wanna sweeten it. You wanna give it a little bit of, um, able to be stirred, you know, you want to thin it, okay? So you sweeten it with maple syrup, you thin it with apple juice, and you season it with the spices that you like. So really, you don't need a recipe. Um, put it in a preferably nonstick pan and then cook it to the des desired consistency that you like. You know, if you want it really thick, then don't put as much apple juice. If you want to thin it out a little bit to use it, and I forgot to mention that pumpkin butter is very versatile. You can do lots of good stuff with it. It can be used as a spread. It can be used in smoothies. 
You can put it in um, breads with the breads that you make, um, and it can just be eaten. It's really good. All right, thank you very much. And okay. it looks like Tucker is on, but he his name is now Dana Aguero. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> well, and if you know, if you noticed during the video, I'm sure you did. It said talking Toby Brown, so I thought, oh my gosh, I don't know how to take that off. So I didn't want to mess it up. So, um, so. Uh, Tucker, you are muted. Could you unmute yourself? See if it'll let you. Yes. Okay. So, um, okay. Thank you so much for joining us. Do you have, um, do you ever go through with your beds um, and chop and drop anything or let them compost in place? Uh, pretty much our cover crop is about the only thing that uh, we chop and drop. And what is your cover crop? What do you use as a cover crop? Uh, it varies from year to year because um, a lot of times we'll purchase uh, cover crops that other people have ordered but haven't taken. So we get a discount on it, um, mm -hmm. but primarily consists of legumes um, like Austrian field peas, um, fava beans, um, vetch, and then some grains, whether it's oats or wheat or rye or triticle. Um, and so the, the grains are uptaking residual nutrients and preventing those from being washed away by the winter rains. And then uh, like was mentioned before about the fava beans, uh, the legumes are taking nitrogen out of the air and fi fixing those in the roots. So when we chop and drop, uh, eventually all those nutrients are re-released into the soil. Okay. Oh, that's great. That's great. Now, um, so sometimes you do use a mix of those things, correct? And not just yes. one thing. Okay. Correct. Because okay. I know that a lot of these places where you can buy the cover crop mixes, they have, you know, it, it is a mix. So, mm -hmm. um, okay. Here's another one for you, Tucker. It says, can all dirt be transformed into good soil by amending, composting, planting cover crops, et cetera? Or is some dirt just incapable of being improved? <laughs> um, I'm always cautious about using the term all, but I strongly feel like you can transform almost any site uh, with all of these practices, um, depending on your starting point some areas might take longer than others. Okay, that's that's great. And we don't wanna give up on anything, that's for sure. Right, yeah. Um, okay, Allie, here's one for you. This um, lady says, I've tried every year to keep the aphids out of my favas. My suggest, uh, and any suggestions? Spraying doesn't seem to help. Um, Others in the community garden have the same issue, so. Okay. Um, when, when the aphids come, it's, it, you, try to, you try to take care of them before they multiply too quickly, which they do very rapidly. Uh, generations hatch, and then if the ants find them, they protect them because they use them as little milking cows. And so they, you, can, you can wait and see if the beneficials like the Cirrid Flux, oh, I'm pronouncing it wrong, the lady beetles, the wasps, and the, the surf, somebody jump in, surf. Surfing. Surf surfed flies come and um, attack the aphids. The a you look, you have to turn the leaf over and you look at the body. If it's like a little mummy, it means that there's no more aphid in the shell. The other thing to know is that if the leaves have already curled, it's almost impossible to get rid of the aphids with spraying soapy water or just knocking them off with water because the curled leaf protects them. So as you see a leaf start to curl and you know there are aphids in there, slice off the leaf 
and throw it away because you don't want the population to keep going. And if Tucker has any other suggestions, please jump in. No, I agree. <laughs> All right. Okay, that's good. I know there, but you know what? And you can you can give up with the aphids sometimes too. Um, I try washing them off, and sometimes, hey, you just let them have a plant, and they go for that on that plant, and sometimes the beans come out okay too. So um, also. Mm -hmm. I'm sorry. Also, some people plant flowers near their fathers that are attractive to aphids, hoping that the aphids will use the flowers instead of the plant. Oh, good idea. Good idea. OK, so now, Tucker, we're back to you. Um, there's there's questions about compost. And now, you know, as master gardeners, and we're not supposed to say, hey, you should go to this place and buy your compost. But that is a big problem for folks, trying to pick a compost that is going to be good for the soil. Um, this lady says she doesn't, she'd rather not buy it in bags. So what do you look for when you're looking to purchase compost? So I look for a compost that doesn't have a strong odor. Um, I've experienced, especially in the springtime, companies will push out their compost before they're completely finished and they have this sort of sweet, sour odor to them. Um, so then that means I have to sort of sit on it for a while and finish it off. Um, but I'm also looking for a compost uh, that is approved by the organic Materials uh, Review Institute, which means it's approved for organic production. Um, and so our local landscape supplier brings in a municipal compost um, that also has byproducts of the poultry industry. So it's high in nutrients. Um, and that's what I've been using for a long time now. And it's nice to be able to get it by the truckload as opposed to using bags. Oh, that, yeah, that's great. That's great. And Dana, all right, can you unmute yourself? Tell, um, Dana, Dana, um, don't don't mention the place where you got it, but tell how you got around that that issue of the bags and stuff. So. Oh, so I I love the bags, and I've always bought in bags, and I went to this a local place to pick some up, and they didn't have any, so. And um, they said, but you can, you know, we can give you a half a yard and you can grab bags and fill them up yourself. And at first I was like, ew, <laughs> but I did it. And it was, it was a quarter, fraction of the price. And um, I got way more than I would have actually gotten if I bought four bags. So um, it was, it was a huge uh, win for me. And that's what I'm going to do from now on, even though my car smelled really bad. Yeah, it's okay. <laughs> Perfect. That's <laughs> awesome. And you know, um, you can go through too, and you can bring your own buckets and that kind of thing. I would suggest probably not going Saturday morning when everybody else is there, <laughs> you know, people won't like you taking up all that space, but um, that is definitely an option. And it's a lot cheaper if you do it that way. Um, let's see, Tucker. Um, should they not compost winter squash plants if they've had powdery mildew on them? Um, for a homeowner, I would suggest not. Um, we tend to have a separate compost for um, plants that have either had powdery mildew or other insects on them. Um, but we really focus on getting those piles up to temperature and we have the space to do so. Um, and we tend to uh, turn those piles longer and uh, sit on them longer. Okay, and up to temperature, you're talking like 150, 160, something like yeah. that? Yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah, that's great. And that is sort of hard to do unless you have some space. Um, right. Uh, yeah, and, and sometimes it takes some time. And so one more thing back to the compost. What about, um, 
you know, are there any things besides odor you're looking for? If you're looking on the internet and, you know, you can look up, a lot of places will tell you what's in it. Um, anything else you should shy away from? Um, I mean, I trust the Organic Materials Review Institute for doing their due diligence on the front end. And so that's why I tend to go in that direction. Okay. Um, and I've been utilizing the same compost for a long time now and have had few issues with it. Um, and so I think in my career, that's the one thing that I've seen the most is, especially in the springtime, getting compost that's not quite finished and having to sort of finish it off myself. And, and it's pretty easy to tell if it's not finished, right? Yeah. The smell or just the, if in the morning you can see the steam coming off of it. Um, yeah, uh, you know, and sometimes just having it piled up will do that. But um, yeah, no, I totally agree. Um, okay, Ellie, let's see. Uh, there's another fava bean questions. If, if you choose to harvest your fava beans, is there any nitrogen benefit to be gained by chopping and dropping the plants after I harvest? Well, not a lot because the plant itself uses a lot of the nitrogen, but any organic matter you can add to your soil is helpful. Um, I think that that's the answer there. Yeah, exactly. Boy, that's great. Any organic matter. And you remember in the video that, that Tucker said that they have 10% organic matter in their soil, which is really high. So, um, okay. So um, let's see, you want to keep that organic matter in there. And the plant does, I mean, it has those nodules on the roots for a reason. I mean, it wants to use those too. So that's what goes up and it's used for- It makes you beans, yeah. Yeah, it makes you beans. So you can't have quite everything, but composting the material definitely, um, it definitely helps. All right, okay. So we went through the pumpkins and Here's some master food preserver resources that you may uh, want to take a picture of. We have an excellent um, Facebook page for master food preservers. In fact, um, Kathleen that does our master food preserver page. Wow. I mean, sometimes it's easier to just go to our page first. So here's some resources for um, master gardeners and those you'll find under the QR code as, as well. We, you may be getting a survey after this. We thank you for filling that out. And then if you want to go through and get preservation information or anything that we've talked about, this QR code will lead you to that spot. So we thank you so much for um, joining us today. We are going to go through and uh, for, in November, we have a really great show already lined up for you about planning your spring garden. So um, come and join us. We're also gonna um, make fruit shrubs with Master Food Preservers. So thank you for joining us and we'll see you in November. <music>